Kia ora Tom Scott, nā au, uh, Simon, Bird, and Tessie Ega, so, um, <clears throat> uh, au revoir, um, assalamu alaikum, um, I, I hope uh, everybody is is well. I I, I know uh, some some words in other languages, and I I find it absolutely fascinating when we can connect to another person, especially in their own languages. My name is Simon Bird. I am currently uh, the director of education for Lac La Ronde Indian Band, uh, located on Treaty Six territory. And uh, we are in the traditional lands of the uh, the Woodland Cree or Woods Cree. Uh, locally, uh, many people identify themselves as Woodland Cree. Uh, many people have have come to really discover some of their traditional names as other um, Cree neighboring um, um, relatives uh, have, have called us as Sini Skyinuk. People of the Rocks. We are a TH speaking uh, dialect, and <clears throat> I, I operate. I run. I'm a content. Uh, uh, I'm a content uh, creator. Uh, I guess uh, that's what they call somebody that does a lot of stuff on social media. Um, with over twenty thousand nine hundred, I believe it was. It is now twenty thousand nine hundred members on on hashtag uh, Cree Simon says. And I'm also a student uh, at the University of Victoria. I'm, doing, I'm, I'm pursuing my PhD in Indigenous Language Revitalization. It is an absolute honor to be amongst uh, people as yourselves that have a passion of, of education. And for myself, <clears throat> I am an L1 speaker. And I've, I've learned my language in my home community uh, in the 80s, uh, surrounded by family, friends that spoke the language. I, I absolutely revere and have the utmost respect for L2 speakers that now have a good command of the language. One of the stories that I have to tell you before we begin, I have a PowerPoint slide um, prepared. The, uh, it'll, this will be the second time I'm, I'm, I'll be using this particular PowerPoint in a very in, in a similar, um, you know, audience, uh, vir virtual audience. Um, you know, um, back in 2015, I found myself uh, surrounded by no crease at all in Treaty Seven territory, just outside of Calgary working uh, with the Stony Nakoda people in Morley, Alberta. And I found my little girl was coming home and she was excited to be speaking the Nakoda language. And I was very excited for her. <clears throat> I found myself wanting to, to almost fill that gap that I knew I wasn't providing. And so <clears throat> I'm the only L1 speaker in our home my, my wife is also white dialect Cree, but she doesn't speak the language, but her fam, her, her dad is an L1 speaker. And, but her mom is a, a, a Anishinaabe from um, uh, uh, Winnipeg area. And, and so when I was out there, I found myself really, really missing the language. And if you come from another place into, a, um, you know, I'm sure you can identify with moving to another place and and almost seemingly missing something inside you and wanting to talk wanting to connect and that happened to me and that happened to me in in morley alberta and i, I found myself wanting to teach and so i i my, my little girl nitanis was about six years old at the time and i said uh, you know on a Saturday morning, can you say Mio Gisigo? And uh, she, she said, what does that mean? I said, Mio Gisigo. Mio Gisigo. And she said, and she laughed in the sweetest little laugh that little girls make. And she said, it sounds like you're saying, may you kiss a cow. So may you kiss a cow. And I, uh, you know, Mio Gisigo means it's a nice day. It is a good day in the wide dialect. 
And I found it uh, so cute and so fascinating and so creative. So I shared that on social media on my personal account. And uh, people really, I noticed that people were commenting. And uh, they said, I can remember that. I have a hard time remembering words that I, I have no connection to. Mio Gisigao. And she says, May you kiss a cow. And so I, I started a, a small group, uh, a hashtag Cree Simon Says. And people started adding and adding and adding. And I, I didn't realize, but I guess that May you kiss a cow, that meme I shared, um, you know, uh, was viewed by a, a young man who was in grade 11 at the time in Gimli, Manitoba. And he came across that thing shared by one of his relatives and he looked at it and said, that can't be Cree. Dismissed it and he kept coming back to that word. And then when I created a page, he, he clicked on it. And then I, I taught using these mnemonics. May you kiss a cow, this to kiss a cow, which is Wednesday. Be a kiss a cow, which is Monday, the first day. You know, <clears throat> a lot of these little fun ways of connecting and uh, and then he started asking me questions. He started inboxing me questions. And, and then he uh, later realized that, well, he knew that his family were once Cree speakers. His great-grandmother was the, first, the last one to speak the language. And throughout these two years in grade 11 and grade 12, this young man had a really, a real deep sense of connection to the, to the language. His name is Cameron Adams, and uh, he'll he'll tell you the story if you ever ask him. And so what happened from there was he went on to the University of Manitoba in Winnipeg, and he pursued uh, arts and science, started to take Cree classes, met some Cree teachers, asked more questions. Whatever he learned at university, he checked with social media, and whatever he, he learned from social media, he went back to the, his instructors. And today, he's in his last year um, of of, uh, of taking his B.A. I, I, I take no credit for, for how far he has come. But, um, you, you know, um, he has um, – um, he is a uh, – uh, today, he has a, a very good command of the language, a very good command of the language. Uh, Cameron Adams, um, I, I, I'm able to speak with him. Um, I'm able to speak with him in the language, in his own dialect. Yeah, he can actually talk very, very well. And I, I, I find that such a, a fascinating, uh, I find that, that whole thing fascinating because I, I realize what I do, what I do is, and I'm sure everybody to a degree um, knows that we can only fill certain roles as teachers. The language has to be spoken at home. It has to be immersed in some way, shape, or form outside of the classroom on an ongoing basis. And that's what I that's what I share today is how important it is that each and every one of us plays a role and we don't know exactly how our specific role will influence or impact somebody down the line. But I have a lot of little stories like that that really keep me going. And so on a daily basis, I post on social media anywhere from 5.30 a.m. to 7 a.m. I spend, sometimes I spend a little bit um, too, too much, a little bit too much time, um, um, a little bit too much time on social media. But, you know, um, <clears throat> so that's, that's what the, that's what it is. Uh, Miss Simon Bird, hashtag Cree Simon says, my, my presentation is called Location, Location, Location. Uh, who am I? Uh, for First Nations people, it's very important that we, that we make inroads as to how we connect first. So my presentation will be introducing who I am. 
uh, this is me as a uh, a pistawasis, a little, a little, a little kid, a little child. Awasis means child. And this is the family I grew up with. Uh, my dad uh, was the one taking the picture, and that's uh, Nisimis. And uh, the baby is uh, my youngest, uh, my young brother, and I'm the oldest of three. And as I got older. <clears throat> Um, my my parents uh, adopted, uh, raised uh, one of my one of my relatives, which I call my sister today. And this is the youngest sister today. Um, as my parents got older, uh, more there was a, a need to extend their families. Uh, I have already left home uh, by the time uh, sunshine uh, came around, and this is my sister calling. So both are my sisters. And this is uh, me when I was young. I always had a fascination with with Bruce Lee. That I would be the one in the middle. These are my parents. Uh, you can actually often see them in this way uh, in the winter. Uh, my dad is traveling through town here, and I, uh, he he has a, a dog team, and he was doing dog sled demonstrations in in a nearby community. And my mom is at home. Uh, this is my late grandmother. Uh, we lost her uh, in 2018, at the beginning of 2019. And I went to go visit her. <clears throat> and so this is uh, her last year with us. And these are my family. Uh, this is Nui Igimagan, uh, my wife. Uh, Nigosis, my son. He's uh, six foot, about six foot six. And uh, Nitanis, my, my little girl. This picture was taken about uh, three years ago. And again, I acknowledge my, my first teacher that m really answered a lot of the questions that I have. And then this picture is back home at Saga Higani, back home in Reindeer Lake. It's a 200 kilometer long lake. And this is all she's ever known to be home. Uh, she has traveled as far away as uh, Saskatoon. But, uh, but not very often. Uh, her whole life was spent living on a land, and she would be the one to tell me the stories of who I really connect with and identify with as a as an indigenous person. And identity and location. My community is again uh, located in northern Saskatchewan. Kiwitnog, Kiwitnog is how we say it, up north. And the reason why South End got its name is because it's on the south end of Ranger Lake. And this is the traditional territory of, of uh, Cree people. Um, I, I would even say uh, I would bring down the yellow uh, just to Ranger Lake because uh, we're going into Dene territory. Nihidawak, <clears throat> the woodland Cree people. Asininok, the rock Cree. Missinipi the Ninok, Big River Cree, all in the TH dialect. My community is called Wapa Tigotsuanok in our language, and it means the narrows with the current. Wapa Tigotsuanok. And this is what it looked like when I was uh, growing up. This picture well, would have been <clears throat> around 19. I would say in the late 1980s, and my my family's home is right where my cursor is. And this is this big building is uh, the local uh, arena, and this is the school. I think this picture would would have been 19 about 1995, and this is an island. And this the reason why this is called Wapa I know this this. This here narrows is called Wapao, Wapao. It Michoac. There's a there's a current, there's a current on that narrows, and there's a, a land bridge that connects um, the uh, the outer world to our island. This is a, a big island that you can that you can circle around with a boat. Uh, before the bridge slowed down the water, this was a very very dangerous time to travel. <clears throat> because the there's you know the, with the current the ice never freezes. 
again, I, I point out to the location of our of our family and our traditional lands, the green that you see on the screen, the uh, the, the the middle uh, is Precambrian Shield, and so that's why we are called the the Rock Cree people. Um, we hunt moose, uh, we hunt uh, fish, uh, we hunt caribou, and we fish for fish. I mean to say, we hunt fish. This is uh, Nistao, this is my brother-in-law, and this is uh, Nuhtawi, this is my dad. But for a lot of who we are, um, I think it's fair to say, yeah, historically, a lot of our people um, utilize the, the river system. And uh, our people uh, were um, laborers, we were trappers during the fur trade era. And as you can see, what you see on your map here, you don't see highways, you see river systems. And these river systems is what connected to our, connected all our people. And just in talking about the significance of the river is what a river does is it, it flows. It flows from one direction to the next. And can somebody tell me what happens when you stop a river from flowing? I can't see any comments, so you're going to have to tell me. Somebody that uh, recently, um, maybe somebody that wears glasses. Can you tell me what happens when a river is stopped and no longer flows? What happens to a river? It floods to the sides. And yes, yes. And and what happens to a river when you have enough, when you stop the river from flowing, of course, is um, you start to have small, smaller pools of water and there's no longer um, anything that, that flows through. And what happens when a river stops flowing? And what happens when you have pools of water? Beyond algae? Excuse me? Algae? You build the green things on the, on the sides and everything? Lichen, and that, that tends to happen because water becomes stagnant. And when water becomes stagnant, you know, what happens with the river is it naturally replenishes, it naturally cleans itself out. And when you have stagnant water that no longer connects, you start to have these, uh, these, these pests. Um, and then you start to have, uh, in, in a lot of places, the disease carriers are the mosquitoes and the flies. And so this analogy of a river is, it can be um, associated with the mentality of, of, of our indigenous people. The rivers that connected us no longer connected us. The reservations that were introduced to our people really brought about a different way of thinking and intolerance. I've never met such, you know, tolerant people like I, like I know um, our elders that lived on the land and that remember what it's like to take their family to go visit homes without having to worry about staying in one place. You know, my community of South End is a, is a natural um, stopping area. And that's, that's, that's what I've noticed is even though we have cell phones, text messages, emails, roads, and our people before colonization were much more connected, having to go down the river, up the river, up the lake, stopping where you need to, stopping the family to visit family, hunting when you needed to, uh, and then going back to a traditional winter camp or summer camp. My grandmother lived this area in this era. The connection to our location and how land shaped language 
In <clears throat> northern Saskatchewan, uh, Alberta, and Manitoba, the Cree speakers identify with six seasons. And a lot of that has to do with the ice. There is um, summer, there is um, breakup, I'm sorry, summer, fall, freeze up, winter, breakup, and then spring. There's two additional seasons from what we, you might traditionally know um, in, in mainstream Canadian uh, language. And here we have every, everybody, and, and the, we always, uh, we've always identified and observed the, uh, what was around us. In the month of March, in, in our language, in our dialect, we identify March as Megisuipisim. Megisu, Megisu is the uh, eagle. We started seeing the eagle in these parts um, right at the tail end of February, right in the beginning of March. It was still quite cold, but it started warming up um, no longer than, than two weeks later. And we, we still, now we see more and more eagles flying in our area. Now to the south, to the south, what they call in the same Cree, the wide dialect will call um, this previous month, uh, February, as Megisuipisim, because that's when the eagle came to their part of the territory. So I, I always find it, I, I always found it confusing that um, in up north, they would have a different name for the, the Cree um, months of the year. And then when I learned to speak Cree down south, they would be teaching us a little bit of a different scenario. And it wasn't uh, until I got older when I started to really compare why things were the way they were. It was a lot of it has to do with the land, the location. <clears throat> Up north, my, my, my dad likes to take out uh, uh, young, young kids. Uh, this is my, um, my, my, my niece. And a lot of these are, are kids that don't normally identify or quite fit into a classroom. Uh, he has uh, what we call, a, I guess, a, um, birds culture camps. And he'll, he'll write a grant, get some money, and take, take some of the kids in town and, and take them by boat with, with a couple other um, older people and, and show them the medicines that we gather. This pineapple looking medicine is actually uh, what we call rat root. And that's what the kids are digging up from, from underneath the, uh, the plants that you see along the shorelines. This is my father. <clears throat> um, traditionally, we, we never had plastic bags. When you killed the moose, you, you took the delicacies. And what you can see on the left side is uh, two kidneys. And you can see the uh, the the, uh, the intestine, the uh, stomach lining, and this is what you would call tripe. You know, if you if you enjoy any kind of dim sum, it that's the same stuff. That's a that's the stomach lining of a of a of a moose. And <clears throat> uh, so that's this is a, a reused, uh, repurposed um, from a moose. You you take you take the delicacies. And then you put them in there, and that's how you would transport uh, traditionally, um, or still today, when when hunters don't have a, a plastic bag or a bag, they just put it in that in that um, in that stomach. And then when you get home, you you take it out, and then you you eat it in in the, however way you prefer. This here is the the insides of a, a whitefish. Atigami, and many of our elders and a lot of our adults, that's what we do is we boil specific parts of the, uh, of the fish. And a lot of our hunters, a lot of our outdoors people, we utilize everything from the land, especially the further north you go. The less you pack, the better. And these are just, you know, um, moose ribs that you cook on a fire um, and 
everything that you need is really the, it, it provided by everything around you. <clears throat> this is uh, Nigawi, this is my mom, and this is Kutawan. Kutawan is the, the campfire setup, and in the campfire setup, you'll often see fish or moose being, being uh, hanged uh, to dry, to, to preserve uh, through the summer months. Um, and it also adds flavor. And it, it, uh, it, a lot of us didn't have, a lot of First Nations people, Indigenous people didn't have any uh, refrigeration or any way to preserve food when it was hot. So you dry it and it lasts for a very long time. Um, just I also wanted to point out if you have any uh, language, uh, the Cree, the Cree language words, I just wanted to point out that the Cree word for stove is kutawana pisk. Yeah, we have a <clears throat> um, um, to polysynthetic language, and the word morph that I just talked about um, is made up of two words. Kutawan is what you see here, kutawan, and biwa pisk. Biwa pisk means metal. Kutawana pisk. You add those two. Kutawana pisk to make the word for stove. Stove, which literally means metal campfire. And this is myself. This is my dad. And this is Negoapasik, uh, or Negoapak is what we call it. And then we spent many days on the boat. And that's, I would always hear the language and that's uh, where i prefer to be uh, up until i was 18 i never had any desire to go outside of our community in fact my first year university in prince albert saskatchewan i had some culture shock and i wanted to go home and i and i quit after a year and you know uh, as most men will probably tell you the reason why they they went on to do great things or moved away from their comfort zone was due to a, wo a woman. And that's when I, I, I met my wife. And then I went back down south um, a year after I had, uh, I, I swore never to go back to university or move down south again because I didn't like it. And my wife uh, has been instrumental in having myself attain uh, my Bachelor of Education, my Master's of Education, my Master's of Northern Governance and Development, and also in my pursuit for doctorate. And this is in the winter time. And this is uh, the, the you can see the t the tip of the ice uh, on the ice uh, the the fish net. And so these gentlemen are <clears throat> um, they they went fishing in the lake. With a, with a net and they made the fish and right on the shoreline, they made a fire and you don't need a plate. And this is more or less a demonstration and it, it can be done, but a lot of folks today, you know, we, we take the, you know, the metal teapot, the metal frying pan, but for a lot of hunters, uh, traditionally all they took was a backpack, um, a small rifle, and uh, an axe uh, and a knife and that's all they took they went out in the bush and they spent they would spend the whole entire winter and uh, in need of very little to nothing and then they came back with with a lot of fur uh, fur pelts and the, the fur pelts were their way of uh, of, of uh, supporting their families uh, this is my dad talking about this community here. This is my my home community of South End and what it looked like when he was a small boy. As you can probably tell from the previous picture, there'd be a lot more, a lot more buildings and a lot more houses. A connection to our uh, location, land, people, and language. I, I have a question, and feel free to answer anybody. It true or false, the Blackfeet, the Sutina people, which are the Dene, the Stony Nakoda, and the Cree people all have the same word for 
uh, Calgary, which is Elbow River. Anybody care to give it a shot, true or false? I'm going to guess true because we do have an Elbow River in Calgary. Yeah, it is very true. I, I uh, think more or less I, I think more or less I, I gave away the answer there, but thank you very much. The um, this is a picture during the one of the stampedes, and Calgary. The Cree word for Calgary is uh, a, a, a man's elbow, or a human, a human elbow. Uh, and all the language, the languages up there, all have the same name for Calgary uh, because the the river, uh, when when viewed from uh, one of the higher hills, looked like a a, a man's or a, a, a human a human elbow in their languages. Uh, true or false? I'm not going to give the answer for this one. The Cree word for horse literally means big dog. Yes, true. And one of the, yeah, that is true. One of the most fascinating things that I came across was um, how the Dakota people had a similar translation. Their their word was holy dog. Blackfoot people, they called the horse elk dog. The Dene, which uh, they used the word clay cho, big dog. The Inuit people, they call the horse big dog. The Stony Nakoda people, Shawatanga, they call the uh, the horse big dog. So I, I, I love talking about this because as indigenous people, we have more. We have, we have a lot in common, and then when we talk about a specific language group and dialects, we have more in common than we don't. So the Plains Cree, the the Woods Cree, the Swampy Cree. I can I'm I'm proficient in all those uh, dialects, and um, we have we have more in common than we don't. Uh, the Ojibwe language because we all belong to the same language family, the Algonquin language family. I, I can I can pick out a lot of the words that are said in, in Anishinaabemwe, which means uh, Ojibwe. And I'm a big fan of etymology. Uh, and so <clears throat> this word here, pigo, is the, the ash that you, you, you see after you make a fire. And that word is found in blackfly, pigosis, and it's also found in a common word for coffee, pigotiwapoi, which would literally mean ash, ash liquid, ash drink. One of the other things that I love teaching uh, any kids or any teachers is the word isquesis which means uh, girl, yeah, but it literally means little woman. So to call a squeezes a girl uh, by this name is to remind her of who she is. She is to be a woman to be. She cannot be denied her destiny of strength. Uh, to call her by any other name is to deny her uh, by her rightful place. And we find the same thing with the word not pieces, which means um, little man or a man to be. The word for a woman is esquail, esquail. The word for a girl is esquesis. Those two words even sound the same. And then in what we have for the uh, for for boy is not pieces and for man is not bill. And when we speak the language and when we really allow the language to guide us in, in all the, the hints, all the teachings it has, it really starts to help a person realize how we as adults are supposed to conduct ourselves and how we as kids are supposed to conduct ourselves. And we, especially when we're around um, younger, younger people or older people. That's just a couple examples of, of how 
deep the language is when we start to pay attention to the words and the meanings. A connection to our language, stories, people, language. Well, for one example, a common word for thunder is kihtoak. It's actually a description of, of, it's a verb, and it means they are calling. And when I was 12 years old, I would ask my grandmother, I, I actually, I, I must have been about 10 or 9, from what I recall. I was asking, my, my grandmother says, come on in, get to work. And I looked at her, and I said, well, who, who, who's calling? In, in our language, I was talking to her in our language, and she said, she looked at me, and she kind of shook her head a little bit, and she said, the Thunderbirds. I said, Thunderbirds? And uh, yeah, the Thunderbirds, uh, those are the ones that are calling each other. And so our, our Cree language, even though um, our small community of South End um, was uh, in a lot of ways influenced by the church, the language still retained a lot of these stories about what our people seen um, around and what they believed around who they where they were and who they were even before the uh, the introduction of, of uh, Christianity and when I was growing up nobody talked about you know it was bad to talk about the drum it's bad to talk about Indian medicine uh, and yet our language had all these teachings it was it was fascinating for a young boy to be able to to know a lot of the language and it led me to have a lot of the stories that we hear today. You know, if you look up at the um, uh, Northern Lights, you'll, you'll see them wavering almost uh, from side to side. <clears throat> and the Cree word for Northern Lights is wah-wah-ti-wak. And if you really listen to that word, wah-wah-ti-wak, you can actually pick out the, the word, they are walking from side to side you know it, it, it's not not in one spot they're walking along from one side to another to the next and as as Cree people we believe that these are our ancestors that that come the, the um, our loved ones that um, uh, our loved ones that came that are that are just celebrating and wherever they are and we just happen to see um how what 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 um you know they're they're here for a visit and that's you know that's i i when i see the the uh, northern lights that's that's who i see and i that's who reminds me of of our loved ones that have passed on and that's what i love to do today is i i, I hope to help our young people at least have that little spark and so they can start answering some of the questions that I that I love uh, asking, and I, I firmly believe that a lot of our young people, and they don't, they're not introduced at least in some small way about our language. They start forgetting that uh, our language is very spiritual. Uh, the, the the spirit world is eternal, and these are f just five reasons why our First Nations language, our Indigenous language, should never be obsolete. It is a social language. It connects with others. It is very humorous. The humor is timeless. It is a language full of teachings you know, to heal the body and the spirit. And it is a descriptive language because we are very social beings. As human beings, we're meant to connect. <clears throat> you know, it's uh, 7.53 and I want to tell you a small story before we take a break. Um, long time ago, there was uh, that the world went dark and cold. The sun never came up, and all the world's fire came um, was was out, and the only fire that existed anywhere in the world was retained by a, a small group of, of indigenous people. And, it, you know, uh, this was, this was, uh, the story was shared to me by Cecil King, an Anishinaabe uh, elder. 
And so he talked about how people, when they get cold, when they get hungry, they get desperate. And in that, in, inside that small, tiny circle of a small burning fire were the gentlest of people. Uh, you could say that these were elders. Maybe you could say these are just wise teachers. But they were the ones that were very careful not to breathe out that fire. And surrounding these people, upon layers upon layers, around and round and round, were other people supporting the center of that circle. So, because they knew that once that fire went out, there would be no fire anywhere that the last of the fire would would be dis, would disappear that the outer layer of this circle of people were busy fighting off all these different kinds of people around the world <clears throat> and you know try to calm down the situation sometimes getting physical and but it, within each circle that went inside in inside and inside everybody had a different role to support each other and I like to share this story, especially with indigenous teachers, uh, language teachers, because, you know, sometimes we feel that if we are not fluent in the language, we don't have a role to play. Yet in that description of that circle, you have different jobs for different people with each layer supporting one another. So that's what I want to share so far. If anybody has any questions, I can also have another five minutes uh, of presentation. Any Simon, questions? Yeah. my name is Josephine. Can you just tell again the meaning of the first one you said, may you kiss a cow? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a nice day. It's a nice day. Oh, okay. Nice day. And then you had five questions. Who am I, where I came from, and what were the three others? Yeah, I can display it up here just very Oh, that's quickly. good. Thank you. Yeah. And what you might want to do is uh, sometimes what I do is I take a screenshot or I just bring my cell phone like this and I oh, and okay. I call it. So let me just uh, <clears throat> display the screen one more time here. Who am I connected? Okay. Uh, yeah. Who am I connected to? How do I introduce myself? Connected to. Okay. And my last question is you said you had six seasons, and I caught February where the eagles will come out. What's the other season? I missed that out. That's, that's a month. That's one month. And that's the month of March. There oh. is, there is a um, winter ice breakup, spring, summer, fall, ice freeze up. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. A very interesting presentation. Yeah. Any other questions? Simon, can I ask you something? Like we were discussing today with Maria Campbell and um, our Nushka Tavin Center, like when 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 we are meeting, uh, you know, in variety of places, uh, you know, Western civilization and its colonization, they created these hierarchies, and even in academia, I'm I'm sure you know this very well. There is usually panel, and there is the leader, and we have to be quiet when somebody is presenting. It's very hierarchical. And we are trying to introduce a space uh, where we basically share the things in a circle where nobody is trying to, uh, you know, bully other people or uh, be aggressive or that kind of behavior. So what would be the Cree word for that space? Um, I'm going to type it up. 
Uh, I'm sorry I, if I put you, I didn't mean to put you on the spot. I'm just interested because uh, we were trying to brainstorm to replace the word panel uh, with something that indicates uh, friendly, equal status and uh, the things you've mentioned, humor, uh, kindness uh, in that kind of situation. No, no, this is this is a very good question and I really I really do appreciate it. Let me just uh, bring something up here that I can I can type. Oh, by the way, this here is a presentation that I previously did. And I basically, uh, you can take your phone and you can scan that QR code. And um, it's very easy. I can actually teach you how to do that if you don't know how. But uh, I just wanted to, uh, again, um, just bring Simon, I took a screenshot. Is it okay if I share a few of these on our Facebook page? And if there is your code, <laughs> is it okay? Yep. Thank you so much. I can, actually, I can actually share the document as well. Wonderful. Can you can you see what I'm what I'm putting up there? Yes, we can see that. Um, All right. I'm away. Apuin, mama we apuin, mama we apuin is a word, a word morph. Mama we means together, and up. Uh, you can actually put apuin, or you can actually put apuin. It's the act of sitting down together. That's that's all this means. And I was actually telling my dad today. I said. I have to have a meeting at seven o'clock. I couldn't go meet him because I'm, I, I had a commitment at seven today. And that word for meeting, um, if you if you ask a, a fluent adult speaker and they say, How, what's, your, what's the word for meeting? And they'll say, And that literally means the act of, uh, the act of, 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 of sitting uh, together. And so if I was to describe to anybody else what I'm doing right now with you, I would say I am I am meeting, but we're actually the word literally means I am sitting down together. That's what that means. Thank you so much. <laughs> hey, um, you know it, it is uh St. Patty's Day, and some people will, will Indigenous people will not, in any shape, way, or form, acknowledge anything regarding Saint anything. But um, I'm more of a, you know what, uh, it's okay kind of guy, you know, whatever kind of guy. Um, in fact, my grandmother's grandfather was from from Ireland, and so you could say I'm I'm part Irish, especially on March 17. So St. Patty's Day, happy St. Patty's Day to anybody that's celebrating. Simon, it would be lovely if we could have you um, for some kind of symposium organized by ELA around Mother Language Day next year, and if we could celebrate Cree on that day. We were trying to accomplish it this year, but it, it was a bit challenging because of the pandemic. But I hope pandemic will be gone next year. And if we, if we can get our communities together, and celebrate indigenous languages and Cree on that day, that would be just unique historical experience probably for ELA and, and for the community as well. So we would be honored to have you. All right. And I just wanted to also just share that I, I have presented uh, virtually um, <clears throat> there uh, last week, I've, the University of Hawaii um, had uh, the ICLDC uh, conference. And then I, I actually was the master of ceremonies for the Assembly of First Nations, uh, which is a, a, a national organization. And then the week before, I also co emceed another national event uh, uh, through the NCCIE, with National um, um, Center for the Collaboration of Indigenous Education. And this June, I'm also 
presenting at uh, Queen's University on social media and um, indigenous language revitalization. So I, I could I could present a number of those topics. Uh, I'm I'm very very passionate, very interested about um, what we do right now, and I'm also very cognizant of the time that you know it is the evening. If if somebody says we're doing this for an hour, let's stick to that hour so we can we don't um, get uh, any kind of. Uh, we don't overdose on technology so yeah invite me back um if, it, if the timing works out i'll be more than happy to come i'm so grateful we finally managed to get you to come to us so it, it's just been wonderful and i've learned so many things from you um especially from today but from following you for for years now so i'm so glad we managed to to get you here tonight Thank you. And, and what, what, what you have done is you, you've given me more motivation to continue. Some days I, I kind of sit back and say, what am I, what am I really accomplishing by posting uh, on a daily basis on Facebook? But in the end, uh, I, I think that um, we, we all have a role to play. So with that said, Niawain, Kinanash Kumit Niawaw, <clears throat> uh, but a quick recap nonetheless. I, I love telling the story about how people are connected because, of course, as teachers, that's what we do is we find that connection. And as this is that connection is especially important for Aboriginal people, Indigenous people. And in fact, uh, it wasn't very long ago that we started to use our first names to acknowledge each other. Um, before that, we always acknowledged each other by how we were related. And this would be Nimama, Negawi, which is two common ways of saying my mother, Nisimisak, my younger siblings. Nisimis, and this is another younger sibling. You know, uh, for a younger sibling, um, we don't have gender specific terms. And so when we say my younger sibling, we say Nisimis, and then we start describing a deeper connection of, you know, if it's a, if it's a boy or if it's a girl. And I am the oldest of three. Uh, this picture was taken in, of course, the 80s. And Negawi um, and Nuktawi, they adopted two girls. And uh, Colleen, and this is Sunshine. Sunshine is about 11 years old today. And Colleen is, I uh, believe she's about 25 today. She just uh, wants to be a teacher by profession and that's what I am today. I am uh, I have a, a Bachelor of Education at the University of Saskatchewan. I, I didn't realize how hard it was to get a degree until I went back to school. I, of course as a young person you're I think you're you know we didn't have any kids. My wife and I have been together for 20 years, 21 years this year and we went to school together and it made it a lot of fun and when I was growing up um, definitely Bruce Lee, as you probably see by the outfits there, was a big impact for a lot of kids. And that was, I think that would have been our, one of our first, you know, identifiable folk heroes coming off the screen, you know, TV, VHS, uh, movies. And something I've noticed that a lot of Indigenous kids gravitated to. In fact, a, a friend of mine, uh, actually, I just met him. He's, uh, he's very, very interested in, in uh, the, um, the connection that Bruce Lee has with Indigenous kids. And so once in a while, if you're, if you're uh, on social media, you'll come across um, Indigenous kids or Indigenous memes, um, you know, Indigenous kids having this Bruce Lee haircut. This is my 
my mother and my father, Nohtawi Negawi. Um, this picture uh, was taken, I would say, about eight years ago. And this is something that my dad uh, still continues today is um, he's uh, he races dogs and, and my mom uh, for a lot of and a lot of times that's what she does to support um, never very far away uh, from uh, supporting this is Nia this is me Nia Nogum this is Nogum Pan my grandmother, Nogum. And for a lot of fluent speakers, we would say Nogum Pan as a, as a way to acknowledge that is my late grandmother. And this uh, was taken uh, three, three and a half years ago. Uh, she, she passed away a year later. Um, she had uh, dementia and uh, uh, of course, uh, from complications from health. She had passed away, and she would have been uh, 80, 86, 87 today. And this is Niwi Gimagan. This is my wife. Nitanis, my daughter. Nigosis. And Nigosis makes us all look very small. He is six foot six. He is in his third year of arts and science. And he, I've, since he was about this age as my cousin here in blue. These are my two best friends growing up. These are my two cousins. Um, since my son was about two and a half, I started convincing him that he was gonna be a medical doctor. And so that's, um, he's, he's very focused. He's a very smart, very smart young man, and that's what he wants to do after four years of arts and science. He wants to go to medical school. Well, Nitanis, Nitanis um, is just as tall as her mom now. This picture was taken um, six years ago, and she's she has uh, a very very artistic side. And she wants, you know, she's been in plays. She takes virtual singing lessons during the pandemic. Very, 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 very strong. There's, there's very little that I can, that I can argue with my, my daughter because I, I think she has uh, the makings of somebody incredible that I, I, would, I would take pity on anybody that uh, was trying to convince her to, to any kind of peer pressure. So I'm very proud of my kids. <clears throat> of course, this is my first teacher, Nogum, Nogum Pan. And this is uh, to, the, to the back of uh, Ranger Lake. And this is facing north, uh, about 200 kilometer lake. And uh, being around the water is how I grew up. And uh, I, I'm very much, uh, I, I have to be around water wherever I live and if not I I take long walks and short jogs towards the water and this here is uh, of course a miskwachi waskahigan a misk of course is a beaver wachi is a lodge a beaver lodge a miskwachi and of course waskahigan is a fort and of course today uh, we call our modern houses Waskahigana. Um, um, so, but in fact, the term Waskahigan predates any of these modern houses. And um, very, very little is actually talked about the etymology of the word Waskahigan, which we commonly use as a house today. A friend of mine, um, Robin McLeod, <clears throat> who is uh, um, from a Lac Laurent Indian band, he's he's a very fluent, very fluent speaker, and he was he was telling me, he said, if you pay attention to that word, waskahigan, and then he says, if you pay really close attention, you can actually see um, how it got its name. Of course, there's waskan is around. And he said, "Those those uh, those forts 
that they built they they, they, um, they built a fort to exclude and protect themselves um, from of course uh, a, a lot of the uh, uh, the fear that people had um, of, of First Nations or indigenous people so a little bit known a little known fact of where that word house the common word for house comes from. And of course, this year is uh, with the, the traditional territory of the Woodland Cree people. And this is what it looked like when I was growing up. <clears throat> um, it, what happened in the 1980s is um, the Indian, Indian and Northern Affairs uh, started a process called devolution. And <clears throat> of course, uh, that was a tail end of a lot of First Nations and Indigenous people still living uh, on the land. So, of course, uh, that came after the 60s and the 70s of civil rights. And so what happened as a ripple effect, the federal government were pressured to uh, stop um, a, a, such a, a strong um, um, paternalistic um, way of administering and, and, and governing Indigenous people. Uh, because, of course, in the 50s, um, we still had um, Indian agents. You know, it was only in the 1970s that Indigenous people were allowed to go to uh, university. Indigenous people were allowed to, uh, to, to, to vote. Indigenous people were allowed to participate in the economy without having to be enfranchised and lose their status rights. And also in the late 70s, mid-70s, um, a, a lot of uh, some, some Indigenous communities started to exploit the, uh, the natural resources, uh, which some might learn about, uh, maybe um, Muscochis, which is in Hobima, uh, which is just uh, north, uh, south of Wetaskiwin. Which I should also mention the word Wetaskiwin. Aski is a, is a word for earth, Aski. And if I say Wetaskiwin, that's the act of sharing land, we Tuskewin. And that's how we would actually say that word in, in Edmonton. We you know, we call it, you know, we, we Tuskewin, where cars cost less than in Wistaskewin. But uh, in, in Cree, uh, it's actually, we say it with, with an emphasis on the word aski, we Tuskewin, we Tuskewin. You know, we chi win, you know, help me. We chi win on, help us. You know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a word that, that, that first part of that word morph, we tusky win is, is a very much an act of, of doing something together. And, and today, um, there's a string of houses all along and into the bush. This is an island, <clears throat> and this is a narrows. And then the narrows has a current, which traditionally was a description of the of the land itself. Wapa Wapao is Wapao is a um, a, a Cree term for narrows, and a Pimichuak, a Pimichuak. You know that that term talks about a current flowing through that narrows which you can kind of, if you listen real close, Saskatchewan, Wapatigochewan, all right? They kind of sound the same in Saskatchewan Oak, Wapatigochewan Oak, and that Ipimichewak, Ipimichewak, Ipimichewan is, is a description of the water. I know it's a, it's a current. That's how the word Saskatchewan got its name. It's a Cree term, and it describes the uh, it's the swift um, flow of water. And of course, we uh, don't have a whole lot of farms up north. We're all we all live in uh, the Precambrian Shield. Um, <clears throat> this year, um, <clears throat> you know, it's the boreal shield, the um, 
um, the Precambrian Shield. Either you can't walk too far or you can't dig too deep before you start hitting some rock. And the, the river system was our traditional um, transportation routes. My brother-in-law. This must have been, uh, geez, uh, it's hard to believe, but that's almost 20 years ago now. And the, uh, the, the fur trade was, was a huge part of northern uh, communities. And I chose this picture because of the, um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a description of, of uh, the water, the river, the waterways. And uh, for a lot of our people, we were middlemen, the Cree people, which is why we are, um, it, we, we, our, our people extend as far, you know, into the Hudson's Bay, right around the Hudson's Bay. And right into the uh, the other side of the Rockies here. Um, well, on this side of the Rockies, there's uh, in the north end of British Columbia. You can still see and uh, Cree communities. And the river system I'm talking about uh, was our traditional highways. And believe it or not, our people were more connected than how we're connected now. You know, we were connected through technology, cell phones, roadways, vehicles, air travel, texting, emails. We're connected in so many ways, but people took the time to really, really connect, which is what I was talking about. We, we didn't, traditionally, you're not supposed to acknowledge somebody by their first name. And a lot of people have forgotten that because we're all in such a rush. You know, uh, we, we acknowledge each other by our, our names and our titles and our where we're from. Now, asking an Indigenous person where they're from can be very tricky. Because for a lot of people, their mom might be from one community or maybe two. And their dad might be from one community or maybe two. So, you know, don't. Don't be surprised if you, when you ask an indigenous person where they're from or what nation they belong to, to give you a little bit of a story. And uh, uh, unless you're really not interested in getting a background story, uh, you may have to settle for, you know, I'm from Edmonton uh, or I'm, I'm from Calgary or I'm from Saskatoon kind of thing. And, but it'll be up to them if they want to tell you a story. And for the new people that came around, and this is very something that I that I talk about. And for anybody else that's that that's listening to this again, I, this is a concept that I just value so much. This is a river, and what happens to a river when it flows? It cleans itself out naturally. All the debris, all the sediments, they clean themselves out. Now, <clears throat> our, our people have, have been um, traveling through, the, through the, the waterways. They would have winter camps. They would have summer camps. They would have spring camps. They would have fall camps. And we weren't nomadic. We were just you know, I, I, nomadic peoples, I guess, in the technical sense, describes the lifestyle we had. But in a lot of ways, we were very, um, we used the land and its resources very sparingly. And that includes the animals, the fish, and everything around it. Because, you know, you, there was harvest time came in the winter, um, it was the fur-bearing animals. It was the fish, and your ability to get the fish is different in different seasons. And so I, I, I talk about this very. I, I'm just so so fascinated about my, my late grandmother's ability to be so tolerant of different people and their different ways of knowing, their different ways of thinking, their different ways of of speaking. And it was only when our river system as an analogy was stopped and people 
were um, colonized to settle into these pools, no longer the ability to travel, but being stuck in a, spe a specific geographic area. And that what I what I experienced when I was a young man, my the older people were so tolerant. Didn't matter if you're non-First Nation, they welcomed you. But when I what ha what happens to water when you cut off its natural path to flow, it starts to be uh, starts to collect sediment. And of course, I I I, I put these little pictures together because you know pests are born from um, <clears throat> stagnant water and of course that, that that pest for a lot of people developed into ignorance you know and, and, and when I was growing up my gra I would ask my grandmother I said how come we don't have sweat lodges because many northern communities you won't see a sweat lodge um, starting to come back. It was, you know, because there was a, a church. And <clears throat> my grandmother said, it's, you know, I, I said, is it wrong? And I was a little boy. I was asking all these questions because I, I didn't know anybody that has sweat lodge. And my, my grandmother said, no, it's not wrong. It's just different. So, but a lot of our young people, my age, nobody, nobody taught them this. So they grew up listening to people in the community, especially outside of the community, coming in, preaching that this is wrong and that's wrong. And they still have that belief today, even though there's people that are trying to um, share, you know, uh, amongst indigenous people that, that uh, way of belief is not wrong, but just a different way of, of, of thinking. And a connection through our land and the shaped language is what I'm talking about. And here we have, uh, for, for Northern people, we have six seasons. We, we don't have four. And a lot of it has to do with the ice. These two seasons, um, right in the middle, is Meduskamin, uh, is of course the TH dialect. In Y dialect, we would say Mioskamen. It is a season between spring and summer. And this is the season where you can actually see the grass, but there's still a lot of ice. For northern communities in Lac La Biche, you will still be able to see people traveling on ice. It may not be with a truck but you can still see people um, walking on it. And um, of course, on the other side, the season between fall and winter is Megiskau. Megiskau is freeze up. This is ice breakup. This is freeze up. These are very important terms. And so this is one of the reasons why the 12 months of the year can be sometimes confusing because the seasons and the names of these seasons actually differ if you're a Cree person in, located in the south or a Cree person located in the north. For an example, Megisuipisim, all right, Megisuipisim is the month of March for northern people because the, the, the word Megisu. For some of you that might be familiar with Migisu Cree Nation, the Migisu is a northern term in Cree for eagle. A southern term is Kihu. Kihu, of course, for, for, many, for some of you might be familiar with Kihu Cree Nation. In, in, uh, some would say northern Alberta, but it's um, not, as, not as north as uh, Lac La Biche or Cold Lake. Megisu comes to our territory for Northern people in the month of March. And the Southern Cree people actually acknowledge 
Megisui Pisim a month earlier in February because the eagle comes to the warmer climates a month early, back to their traditional um, birthing birthing grounds, the, the, which I'm talking about the eagles. And these are just some of the pictures. This, this is uh, what we call bitter root, uh, rat root. Um, and these kids are actually picking, picking them. And it's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a medicine used um, for um, a lot of uh, like lozen lozenges. Um, those are rhizomes in, in English. Um, this is my dad. Again, last time we talked about these are what we call fish pipes. Uh, they're they're the insides of fish, and this is this, you know northern people. This is what we do. Well, we we take a lot of the the, the foods we, we call delicacies. Now the the thing is, I went hunting down south with my with my friends, indigenous people. They don't they don't really touch this stuff. They they only eat the meat and for us northern people these are delicacies and so but they're starting to come around again because what we're doing is we're sharing different ways of eating and a, for a lot of traditional indigenous people um, savoring and saving and eating every, um, almost every part of the body was 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 uh, of an animal was um, a uh, um, normal uh, this is my mom Nigawi, she was just here visiting for a bit, and then she left for the three-hour drive. She came here visiting her first cousin, um, my auntie. That's what that's what how I would acknowledge my mom's um, my mom's uh, first cousin that would be my auntie, and she was diagnosed with cancer, and she is uh, in the um, um, in the hospital here. So, you know, for, 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 for some of you in school, if you see an indigenous person, um, if there's a death in the community or somebody that's sick, you know, that's part of um, our mannerisms, uh, is, is that connection. And that, that's what I think is really counterproductive to school. In some, um, I believe it's in uh, James Bay, they actually spread out the the school year calendar a little bit into the summer. They start a little bit sooner and because they have to take a break during uh, goose hunting season and trapping season, which is right in the middle of uh, um, September. And I think, believe it's in it's in May. So, you know, the, we're, we're still, you know, in terms of education, in terms of school, in terms of schedules, we're still, um, trying to have that indigenous, acknowledge indigenous ways of, of being. <clears throat> uh, another picture of, um, you know, no plates required. You know, a lot of trappers, that's all they would do is they would eat their fish, they eat their game, um, just taking some, some parts of the, uh, the boughs of trees um, and, and cooking wherever they, are, they were. <clears throat> Um, we had a true or false questionnaire at the last time, and my question was, uh, is it true that Cree people, Sutina people, Stony Nakota people, Blackfoot people would all have the same name for Elbow River? And what I said was, yes. The name in all their languages basically says Elbow. We say in Cree the place of the elbow. I also talked about true or false. The Cree word for horse literally means big dog. And I said, yes. Mr. Tim is a Cree word for horse. Mr. Tim. Or another way you can say that is Mr. Tim. And in the Dakota language, they have um, the horse literally translates to holy dog. Blackfoot, they literally translate the word for horse as elk dog. In Dene, they also say big dog, just like the Cree people. In Inuit, Inuktitut, 
they transfer uh, translate the the word for horse as big dog. Stony Nakoda, um, the the uh, the indigenous people um, just outside of Calgary, in between Cochrane and um, uh, Canmore, the Stony Nakoda people, they call the uh, the, ho the the horse uh, Shawatanga, and that means big dog. So we, as Indigenous people, I'd like to share and celebrate how much we have in common, um, because I don't think it's our, it's ever been our way to, to really, um, to pick on the differences, to highlight the differences. I think um, the more we know about history and why certain people were allies, is because they all settled to respect each other in certain ways. And it was very rare. It did happen, but it was very rare that people would, would go to war um, with one another. Uh, talk about, I, I, I love etymology. The word beagle is ash. The word for black fly is ash fly, beagle cease. The word for coffee is ash juice or ash liquid. Uh, talk about um, the etymology of the word esquisis, literally meaning little woman. And traditionally, when we were all fluent speakers, we wouldn't acknowledge people by their names. Even little kids, you would call them by who they were in their place in society. Esquisis literally means little woman. And what that did for a woman was it was a reflection that this little girl was a woman to be. And it would be the same thing for a man. Nahbi sis literally means little man. Nahbi is a man. Nahbi sis is a, um, um, a boy. And a sque sis is a, is a girl. A is um, um, a woman to be. Uh, sorry, sorry, a woman. A the, the language is a language until we start paying attention to what clues it provides. And this is all I do on hashtag Cree Simon says, when I was growing up, I was surrounded by the language. I was surrounded by friends who spoke the language. And when I was ready, I could ask the older people, the master speakers of what I learned from my friends. My friends would just talk and talk and talk and talk but they wouldn't necessarily be paying attention to what they were saying. And so through social media, I am pr 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 providing a platform for people to immerse in the language as, as much as possible. And I, I do this, um, I got to admit, lately I've been discouraged. I've been uh, finding myself a bit too busy and finding myself a bit stressed out because I'm, I'm supposed to be doing my, my doctorate um, in Indigenous language revitalization. And, and, I had a, and I had a suspicion this would happen because I know that going to school is hard. And so, but I'm, I ha I'm hanging in there. <clears throat> I'm hanging in there because I know a lot of people appreciate it. I know a lot of people in social media, they have no other place to go. They don't have anybody to talk to in, in our language. They're all over the world. And they, they've been um, growing up in urban centers. Their grandmothers have passed away two, three, now four generations ago, the last of the speakers. And so what I provide is more of a service and I ask for nothing in return and accept it. You know, people do are very generous to invite me to certain speaking engagements and they, they pay me that way. But on social media, I've never asked for anything in return. Now, speaking of etymology, the word, the common word, a, a common word. You know, I, when, I, when I talk, I always try to have a qualifier in there. I try not to say that this is the way, the one and only way of saying this or that. No, that's not how the language works. The language introduces a concept. 
and that concept might be familiar to you, or it might only be spoken spoken in the south or the north or in Kihu or Bigasukri Nation. We have to pay attention to the differences or a common way of saying certain things. And this word, thunder, kihtuak, kihtuak, thunder, is a is a word that describes they are calling. You know, when you hear a loon crying or singing, or when when you know that's that's a you know you can almost say you know you're 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 listening to them, and that word kitwak was in reference to um, the thunderbirds. And our language again, if you pay attention to the clues it provides, you can start seeing how indigenous people viewed the world. And one of those words that we have is wawahtiwak. Wawahtiwak is a word that we say for northern lights. And the word northern lights literally means they are walking in a in a wave-like fashion, not not crookedly, not crookedly, but in a wave-like fashion, left and right, you know, going going side to side, and you know, in our in our language, northern people, many many people, not only north but Cree people, uh, will say that their loved ones that have passed on, they they come for a visit. That's what they believe. Uh, the, uh, we believe the Northern Lights are. And today, you know, uh, now that we're starting to really pay attention to the needs of our Indigenous kids and how disconnected they've been, either through um, colonization, um, all their elders no longer living, the school has, schools, First Nation schools are taking on more of more of that role that they would have learned from elders, grandparents, even parents, and the, the importance of connection. Because the identity part is so important to Indigenous people that sometimes we do things without even really knowing why we're doing things. So a lot of our, our people have been really pouring themselves into what we call land-based learning. <clears throat> Uh, these are just five points that I usually try to emphasize, especially with young people, of why uh, an indigenous language is important. It's, it's timeless. It is it socially connects one another. It is a humorous language. It's a language full of teachings to heal the body, the spirit. It is a descriptive language. It describes how we as humans are connected. There's a word here that got cut off, connected. And again, you know, um, sometimes indigenous people are seen as um, obsolete, um, not keeping up with the times, but indigenous people did this by choice because the language describes how, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop right there for a bit. And I, I, this is an important point to make. You know, um, indigenous people, inanimate objects were not important. For indigenous people, the connection to family, the connection to the land, the connection to things that are even not of this world, you know, in the spirit world, those things were important. If I was to show you a marker, a pen, pencil, crayon, chalk, highlighter, permanent marker, paintbrush, all these things, in my language, those are all one word, masnahiganatik, a writing stick. Masnahigan, masnahigan is a book, masnahigan. If I say masnahigi, I'm telling you, write. If I say masnahigan, it's a, it's, it's a book. So masnahiganatik, it's a little, so it's, a, it's a writing stick. So the fact that we have all these words in my language of all these writing tools that have different words in English, and in my language, they have basically one word. 
is actually a hint as to how our indigenous people thought of, of, of the world. Inanimate objects were not important. And that's why in Cree territory, you don't see permanent structures. You don't see monuments. You don't see, um, see you know, uh, Mayan um, um, pyramids. It, it was because we, our language was always telling us how to behave, you know, the, the, the fact that we didn't, um, you know, we, we didn't come at things in, 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 in a way where we were, you know, an eye for an eye. You know, we weren't, justice wasn't delivered by, in a very harsh way. In, in fact, my name, Simon Daniel Bird, comes from my late uncle who passed away three years before I was born. And his name was Simon Daniel Bird. And he, he actually died um, uh, drinking um, in a party amongst friends in a fight uh, in a group of people, you know, kicking. And one of those, one of those kicks to the head was one too many and he never made it. And I remember my grandmother telling the story about how the RCMP came over to visit the RCMP people, uh, the RCMP came to, to visit to ask my, my grandmother and my grandfather at the time before he passed away, would you like to press charges? The, uh, that, that, that pressing charges was a very, it was a very foreign concept. Justice was very, you know, was understood to be a process that was not only, you know, not within a person's own ability to exact on another person. So my grandmother said, I don't see the point of actually pressing charges because I, he, he's not going to bring him back. It's, he's, it, Pressing charges and, to, you know, sending somebody to jail is not going to bring him back. You know, uh, this reminds me of another story. I was in politics at one time, and I, and it's very tough to be in politics. And, but what I did was I tried to learn as much as I can about so many things. And I ended up in, in many meetings that I never would dream of ever being. One of those meetings was in... I was talking to uh, the, the, the Senate uh, on the issue of justice uh, in Ottawa. And one of the senators was a former RCMP in one of the northern communities in the, uh, the Northwest Territories. And he was talking about, and we were talking about the issue of justice. And, you know, uh, he asked, he told the story about how the RCMP would go into this um, isolated community once a month. And he told the story about how the community was just a place of peace. There wasn't a whole lot of issues. Yes, uh, there, was, there was an odd trouble here and there. But after that, um, the roads opened up, after the RCMP put... Um, an RCMP station, the crime rate um, increased by 600%. And so the question, before he shared that information, he asked me, what do you think happened after we put a permanent RCMP station in that community? Do you think that crime went down or do you think that crime went up? You know, modern days would actually have us think that, you know, our current justice system would have us think that if once you have a police presence in a community, you will expect that the crime would go down. But the opposite happened. People's ways of dealing with justice the elders being sought for counsel, family members being um, held, um, you know, uh, f had family heads and talking amongst issues, that way of justice 
was tossed to the side and people were told you don't have to worry about dealing with your own issues anymore. The RCMP are here on your behalf to take care of these issues. The elders were pushed aside, family heads were pushed aside, and people wanted to deal with their own issues. And of course, that's what we have today in terms of justice. So we're still developing ways of properly responding to indigenous people's ways, mannerisms, living. And the fact that we have so many indigenous people in, in, incarcerated today, we are one of the highest um, populations within our within our, uh, our, our our current justice system in in, in incarceration. Um, it isn't you know we're not all criminals, but there are a lot of those people that you know are 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 that have gone in for a number of reasons. Um, you know, it's, it's basically a system imposed in a, in a people not understanding how they fit into the system. They're just basically told to do whatever um, the legal system is telling them. And a lot of our people will say kiam. It means uh, it's okay. Kiam is a Cree word. Um, who cares? Let it be. It is what it is rather than fighting the system with the lawyer. A lot of our people don't have money for lawyers. Legal aids are, you know, they're rotating people left and right coming out the door. So so a lot, a lot of our people just say, yeah, yeah I, I did it, I'll go to jail kind of thing. A lot of that attitude. So it's only until recently people have started to really understand what these rights. You know, everybody has rights in Canada, Charter of Freedom Race and whatnot. So. I'll stop there for a bit. Does anybody have any questions? We're going to go to the reading system. Part two now. 15 minutes. I talked too long, eh? <laughs> yeah, if I can say... Yeah. Wonderful. Today, sorry, what, what did you want to say? You're fascinating to listen to. Yeah. Never yeah. apologize. Thank you. Yeah. I, I, I just have a qu one question. You mentioned sure. uh, schools, um, uh, indigenous schools. So what are the supports for these schools? Um, are they supported by the community itself or uh, how do they function? Because we are struggling here with, uh, you know, all sorts of problems, uh, as you can imagine. So I assume that uh, you must be dealing probably with the same pressures. And it is to justice. I, it is obvious. It is all connected, as you've mentioned. There is a river that was stopped. And, you know. Very, very good question. And I am very happy that you asked. I, I have a, a Bachelor of Education. I never went to a residential school. I have a little bit of a backup. When I was going, when I was growing up, we had a, a school in the community and that you know that's that's when uh, that process of devolution started happening our own indigenous people started to get those jobs of teaching in our communities and when i was growing up seeing indigenous teachers in my northern isolated community was nothing different it was nothing strange uh, but the generation before me um, went to day schools uh, and they had a lot of non-indigenous people, and for the most part, northern northern people were were almost um, eased into colonization. When you were when you were close to any mer any major center, when you were uh, close to um, farms farm towns that were after the land. Um, you, the indigenous people were assimilated a lot more aggressively. You know, um, the the the, uh, the railroad that united, you know, united Canada, and any indigenous people along that railroad faced assimilation a lot more aggressively. So the residential school system for them was an, a very aggressive aggressive form of assimilation. 
for northern people, um, we were a lot of people were scooped up. Uh, airplanes uh, would would take the priest and would take the RCMP and collect the kids. But by the time I was I was around, um, I was one of the very first generations to go to school in my community, and then high school included high school included and then I, I i went to university um in saskatoon and then i i became a principal in my community i was a teacher in uh, onion lake i was a teacher in meadow lake i was a superintendent in um, morley alberta i was a principal in montreal lake which is it's about a two-hour drive south of here our own woodland Cree people so i got to really experience indigenous education and the one thing that's been always constant it's a um it's um <clears throat> it's a it's a band-aid solution uh, right now i am a director of education i manage four schools and I have one high school, one K to 12 school, one K to grade seven, and one K to five school. And then I have a daycare, and, the, um, and then I have post secondary. That's what I that's what I help manage. And because we we only have one school um, in in many of our communities. In our community here in Larange, uh, Larange is maybe about 7,000 people in town. It's a town uh, next to our First Nation, side by side. The town has three schools, and we have two schools, three schools, town, two schools, reserve. What starts to happen is the kids that have nowhere else to go, they come to our school. And if they don't make it here, they go into a, a world of um, social issues, gangs, uh, a lot of them um, drinking, abuse. And then town schools, some of our kids will go to these town schools, but the the standards are a lot more unforgiving so if trudy was a larange band member and she was in grade 10 she wants to come to the provincial school and she does <clears throat> couple absence one fight she gets the boot where does she go she comes to she comes to us and a lot you know it starts to be a, a little bit more of a the last, the last, you know, the last place of any kind of uh, hope um, or routine for a lot of kids, so that we're we're stuck with um, this band-aid solution. What essentially what should happen is we should get more funding, and I don't believe funding is all the eternal answer for schools, but this allows for options for specialized programs. Because I've been in a school, Montreal Lake, where a, a bully and a victim of a bully had problems in the school and live in the same community. And most times the victim is the one that is going to be afraid to come to school. And I, as a principal, have had to make a decision. One school in this community, no school in town, no school there is no town. There's only one First Nation. And I've always had to try and separate the very, very real reality of bullies. And I've had to, I've, I've personally had to make a decision that we can only do so much to support the aggressor and the abuser sometimes, and that they have to leave our school because the victim is more important. And what does uh, what happens to those kids that I kick out? We call it a homework program, but the problem is at home. There's no routines at home. They're colonized. A lot of our people are colonized. 
and live in government housing for education. And that's the only sense of identity they have is within that community. A lot of our people, they make a go of it in the, in the urban centers, but there's no support system. You know, uh, we have, you know, uh, better supports in place for people that come from outside of Canada when they come here in a place like Saskatoon or Edmonton than we do for people because it doesn't register for a lot of people. They think, well, you, you, you're you born in Saskatchewan. It's a first world country. Why can't you take advantage of the same opportunities like everybody else in mainstream Canada or even people that come from around the world to make this place their home? But you, it's, it's like two different worlds. And the worst thing that does happen is, because I used to also be a, a counselor, a post-secondary student counselor. And I would always tell my students, I said, you have to say no. You go to school to be going into post-secondary. You cannot have your, your apartment, your student housing be the hotel for relatives. Because on the reserve, we're always sharing food. We're always having visitors because what's yours is mine because a lot of people don't have very much and visiting is a good thing. It has been. This is the way our people have been for generations. And to almost say stop, no more. For you to have the best possible chance of succeeding in post-secondary, you have to stop who you are and you now have to fend for yourself and you cannot let people come in and take whatever from your fridge because you're supposed to be studying. That is a real culture shock. But as an indigenous person, I've had to say that to our young people. They're, they're, they're adults. You know, post-secondary is after grade 12, of course. So that's, that's something that, you know, a lot of people don't realize that, you know, coming from a reservation, you know, you, you, you can, you know, I, I myself, and I'm, there, there's no excuses. I would never make any excuses, but I want to paint a picture of a reality. I, I grew up not drinking, no drugs, two parents, two sets of grandparents. My wife, no drinking, no drugs, two sets of parents, lived in Saskatoon for the majority of her life. Me and her, very clean, very sober, going to university, trying to find a place in Saskatoon was very, very hard. An apartment a place to live, somebody taking a, taking a chance. Sometimes I would use my name, Bird, and we would, we would not use my wife's name, which is Thunderchild, because that sounds too indigenous. And it's, it's very tough, you know. Can you imagine with everything going for us, how much tougher it is for uh, a, a young man or a young woman coming from a single family or maybe even having addictions issues where a lot of our people that come from the reservation system is they go to who they know. It's about that connection. And where do, their, where do our relatives go when they are pushed out of the nice neighborhoods, the nice apartments? We all kind of end up in the rougher neighborhoods. And that's where the same issues that we were escaping from in reserve in a reserve is, you know, we're we're right into the into the inner city most most times because you know the it's not it's not a system that's built for us. It's a system that is um, you know built for people in the city, taxpayers, you know, uh, civil engineers design these neighborhoods. You know, the neighborhoods in big cities are popping up all the time because they're moving out of the old neighborhoods. And so that's a little bit of an FYI. I'm not sure if that's connecting, but that's something that I want to just talk about as well. So it's not about funding as much as it is appropriate supports. Does anybody have any questions? I do. Um, I have a friend who's working in a reserve school close to Edmonton and her school board or sh her school recently got taken over by a school board in Alberta. 
So there's there's kind of a change that's happening where, and it has to do with funding. So while the school once upon a time was all of all held by um, the power was all held by that school um, by Ottawa. Now the band is taken over, and they're they're amalgamating with a school board in Alberta. Do you think that's a good thing? <clears throat> I don't know if my question's clear. I, I yeah no I, I know of the First Nation. It's uh, north. It's north of Edmonton, and uh, in speaking in speaking with some of the, uh, the, 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 the leadership at the time, they, they actually liked it. They were not in a hurry to, um, to, to come out of the, uh, the, the federal government's funding because what happened was it was, uh, um, you, know, uh, you know, that old saying of the, the carrot being dangled um, as, a, as an incentive. So a lot of our First Nations, what happened was this, the pr process of devolution is, you know, aren't you tired of having Indian Affairs tell you what to do? And aren't you tired of no longer making your own decisions? And anybody would say, yes, we're tired of it. But then they were never given the same amount of funding that the federal government were using to implement education because they were projecting with the growth in indigenous population administering funding on behalf of indigenous people was going to be much more expensive so in the short term you are going to be given this amount of money which would be adequate but that the funding would not grow with the, um, the the population, so in, in in that in that first nation that you're referring to, that's only recently. So in the past 80s, 90s, 2000, in the past 30, almost 40 years, our first nations, most most a lot of our first nations, what we're doing is what we what we call a band operated school. And in those 40 years. So many of our schools have seen inadequate um, funding and it, the, the problems have compounded. But the school that you're referring to, are, we're quite happy not to get into that mess. I remember talking to, I believe it was a former chief, it, it, was, a, it was a woman. And she was saying, why would we give up our ability to fund our schools adequately when the government's already doing it? They know and we need an extra teacher, they fund it. We don't want to touch that because as soon as we say we want this or we want that and they only give us that amount of funding when we our needs are this much, then we're asking for some 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 big issues. So I don't think it's a bad idea, but of course I'm a young man, 2020, hindsight is 2020, but um, in a, a lot of ways, I think if people were to somehow see um, where um, where we are now, I, I don't think they would have been so eager to jump at the chance. But, you know, uh, just like in the provincial system, education has always been a political, a, a political, a political um, you know, it's, a, it's been political. So leadership at the time, they were they were promised this and they they went for it. So, but at the same time, for the majority of First Nations, that wouldn't work, because every school that I've been at had so many issues that the only solutions, the best solutions, came from our own people. So our own people being allowed to be part of administration, uh, be part of uh, teaching, having that living in the community, you know, that that took on some very powerful um, solutions. So it's eight fifteen. We never even got to part two yet. <laughs>
But you know what? What I'll what I can do is I'll, I'll quickly show you what it is, and it's about the syllabic writing system. In case you have any kind of written documents, you'll be able to kind of get the basics of how to read the material. If that's okay. I'm only going to spend five minutes on it. I really respect your time, and I do appreciate you joining me today. I, I absolutely um, commend you for um, doing what you do uh, in terms of a you know a teacher, teachers teaching um, as part of their you know Saturdays evenings alternate schedules. So this is the part. I'm not sure if we got to, I got a chance to talk about this last time, but this is essentially our Cree alphabet. This is what we call syllabics. These are the consonants. These are the vowels. W, p, d, g, j, m, n, s, y. Notice that there is no G. There is no Z. There is no X. We do have an R, but it's not used very often. We do have an L. Traditionally, these two letters were not used as often in the Y dialect and also the TH dialect and also the N dialect. And what how this operates is you have this the um, these are partners, okay? W and E with a macron, this little thing at the top is called a macron. We. 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 Wo. Wo. Wa. Wa. That's how that works. And in case you didn't notice, the P, it sounds a bit different from English. Be. P, T, sounds a bit different in our language. T, T, K, K, J, J. Of course, everything else is the same. <clears throat> this is another. Uh, it's the same thing, exact same thing. Nothing different. It's just it looks a little bit cleaner. P. Te, ke, che. Those are the differences in everything you come across using standard Roman orthography, SRO. And this is what I also like to tell people. Feel free to spell whatever you hear uh, Cree speakers say. Spell it phonetically in the way you hear it. And then, of course, try your very best to spell it using SRO. We tamawin. We tamawin. Tell me. K, P, and T. This is how you pronounce those. Lady Gaga, BB, Tara. You know, it's a little bit organic, I would say. Indigenous, there's other indigenous languages that pronounce these same words the same way. Piak, Piesis, Pinesis, Pidesis. Piak means one. Pieces, pineses, pideses is all the same word. That is bird, bird in three different dialects. <clears throat> okay. Did I stop sharing? Oh, and that's what I wanted to just talk about is the our our writing system. It's um, through SRO, but we can't simply take an English word and use um, syllabics. We have to translate that word first into our own language, and then we can write it into. Um, using syllabic. So uh, we couldn't basically write down Trudy in syllabics. We would we would creosize it. Maybe we would put Judy, Judy, or uh, Nina. We would put 
N, I with the macron, Nina. Because Nina actually is a Cree word meaning me, Nina, in the N dialect. Nia is Y dialect. Nida is the GH dialect. So uh, I'll stop there. I, I, as I said, I respect your time. I think we're 20 minutes over. I know that uh, the last thing you want to do is uh, in, cut into your Netflix time. <laughs> so if that's okay, we'll sure. wrap it up. Mm -hmm. Sure. Thank you so much, Simon. This was wonderful. And no worries about the Netflix. We can listen to you for <laughs> forever. And I'm 